fellow named Bergston. Uh, our second speaker will be our president, Adam Posen, who, in addition to being president of the Peterson Institute, he was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England. He is a member of the Council of Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Bellagio Group, but as far as I know, not the Illuminati. Our third speaker will be uh, Masahiro Kawai of the University of Tokyo Graduate School of Public Policy. Uh, until recently, Hiro was the dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute. He was previously special advisor to the ADB president in charge of regional economic cooperation and integration. He also has served as chief economist, the World Bank's uh, East Asia and Pacific region, where he is my wife's boss and as Deputy Vice Minister for International Affairs in the Ministry of Finance. Our final speaker, batting cleanup to, to continue the baseball metaphors that work equally well for Americans and Japanese, is Peter Fisher, who is currently Senior Lecturer, Senior Fellow, Center for Global Business and Government at Dartmouth University. Before that, he was uh, a Senior Director at the Black Rock Investment Institute, Chairman of Black Rock Asia, Undersecretary for Domestic Finance of the Treasury, Executive Vice President of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. To save time in terms of getting up and sitting down, I would ask the four speakers to just play tag team. When the, when the previous speaker finishes, just come on up here. And then when, after Peter speaks, we will all converge on the stage. So, Taka Ito, please. So thank you very much uh, for kind introduction, and I'm very happy to be come back to this building uh, and uh, give you some uh, uh, thoughts on uh, uh, Japanese um, uh, macro situation. And I'll talk about uh, mainly on uh, uh, monetary uh, policy and fiscal policy. So um, you've already seen in the first panel the abenomics. Okay, so abenomics um, has three arrows. First one is aggressive monetary policy and inflation targeting. Second arrow is a flexible fiscal policy. And the third arrow is um, a growth strategy, mainly a structural uh, reform. As um, uh, you might have um, read in the newspaper in the last uh, 15 months, the first arrow has been a big success that uh, uh, to create, to get out of the deflation uh, was objective, and we have achieved uh, halfway uh, towards the 2% 2, 2 inflation targeting. Uh, Japan was under 20-year uh, stagnation and a 15-year uh, deflation, and we are getting out of this uh, long stagnation and deflation. This is a remarkable, remarkable achievement. And this was the um, uh, cooperation between uh, uh, Central Bank and, and uh, Prime Minister Abe's initiative of uh, big change in Central Bank uh, uh, policy. So it, it uh, completely changed from uh, defeatism uh, uh, weak uh, Central Bank to uh, aggressive uh, Central Bank to uh, expand the uh, balance sheet, which is known as a Q QE, QQE in, in Japan, quantitative and qualitative easing. So um, it's almost consensus that first arrow has been a big success. And um, uh, the second arrow, flexible fiscal policy, uh, needs a little bit of explanation. The first part of the, uh, this flexible fiscal policy is a timely, short-run, counter-cyclical fiscal stimulus. So when needed, uh, like you know, co cooperating with the monetary policy to push really uh, 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 boosting uh, demands, uh, uh, fiscal policy was um, uh, stimulus, in the stimulus mode. So uh, uh, right after the Abe uh, took prime ministership that he ordered the big uh, uh, supplementary budget to work on the um, uh, weak demand part, and this really helped to change the mood from deflation to something new, and um, uh, growth rate immediately went to 4% uh, range uh, last year, so first half of last year. 
But that's not the, that was mi misunderstood by some people that, you know, this, this government is just uh, 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 putting uh, uh, fiscal stimulus all the time. It was not, because the Japanese fiscal situation uh, is uh, actually really bad. That debt to GDP ratio is more than 200%. Now, Greece got into trouble when the uh, debt to GDP ratio is 130%, and Italy and Spain, they, they are in the range of 100% to uh, uh, 80%. It's still got into a fiscal crisis. So Japan with a 200% fiscal, uh, uh, the debt to GDP ratio, some people thought, you know, this, this, you know, Japan is on the verge of the fiscal crisis. Others thought, you know, if 200% and no crisis, then we could go to 250%. Both are wrong. Both are wrong. So fiscal crisis didn't happen, has not happened. There are good reason that those 200% de debts are held by Japanese residents who are extremely home biased and risk averse. So uh, Jap through Japanese banking system, domestic residents hold 95% of the Japanese debt. So that's fortunate for the um, fiscal authority. But there is a limit. There is a limit. So when this private savings are exhausted or saturated by the government debt, fiscal crisis will come. Okay. So now the simulations and so on, I, I skip all the details, but my simulation shows that fiscal crisis will happen in 10 years, 10 years, if nothing happens. Okay. And that would be a very, very bad situation. Now, um, how to avoid crisis? Okay. So uh, deficit can be closed. Uh, the deficit is an ex uh, expenditure. Uh, more than uh, uh, tax revenue uh, uh, situation. Deficit, deficit is large still in Japan. How to close the gap? Well, expenditure cuts or tax increase? One of the two, okay? Expenditure, actually, Japanese expenditure um, has been really restrained in the last um, uh, 20 years except social security spending. Social security spending has been steadily rising and rising and rising. And all other expenditures, including uh, uh, self-defense and uh, uh, you know, university uh, uh, professor salary and bureaucrat salary, all decline. And uh, uh, public works has been declining. So if you think that Japanese fiscal deficit has been caused by runaway public works, uh, infrastructure, uh, bridges going nowhere, tunnels going nowhere. That's wrong. It has been controlled in the last 20 years, declining to, to the minimum. So um, in OECD ranking that uh, the size of the government of Japan is uh, you know, the last or second last among the OECD countries. So there is very little you can cut in the expenditure, except, except you control the uh, pension and other social security expenditures, which is politically very difficult. But still, that will help. What, so um, uh, the best bet is tax increase. Okay? Now, which tax? Income tax, corporate income tax, uh, or uh, uh, value-added tax? Those are the three major uh, tax uh, items, and um, uh, that, that, that those are the candidates. Income tax. Well, we are on the verge of the uh, dramatic um, uh, uh, demographic change. All the, ba the baby boomers are now aged uh, between 60 and 65. In five years, they all retire, and that tips the balance to the uh, retirees. And if you increase income tax, that is just uh, uh, putting more burden on the younger generation uh, population is shrinking. Uh, and the uh, pension system is already biased in favor of the older generations. And uh, younger generations know that they, 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 they cannot get the, as, as good social security 
uh, pension plan as um, uh, their parents. So income, increasing income tax is uh, aggravating the, this uh, intergenerational inequality. Corporate tax, tax rate is 40%, and we're talking about decreasing corporate tax rate to, uh, to uh, keep the Japanese uh, companies uh, in Japan. Japanese companies offshoring, uh, holding out, uh, whatever you call that, they're building all the uh, 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 operations uh, abroad because of the uh, uh, because of the high corporate, uh, uh, partly because the high corporate income tax. So the best bet is consumption tax. So that is why that um, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Abe initiated this uh, consumption tax increase, which happened in this April 1. So uh, consumption tax has been um, on the low end, 5% uh, until uh, uh, March this year, was raised 8%. And next year, October, it's going to uh, increase to 10%. 10% VAT is still low in, among the um, OECD countries. Well, U.S. is an uh, exception, but the, no federal VAT. But most European countries have the VAT rate of uh, 20 percent, plus minus five. So uh, when Greece got into trouble, the VAT was already 19 percent. IMF came in, you have to do a tax increase, and uh, they raised to 23 percent, but didn't help much. While Japan has from 10 percent to 25 percent, there's additional 15 percent uh, point uh, uh, tax space, tax increase space. And this has to be uh, exploited, unfortunately, to uh, balance the budget and produce some surplus to bring down this huge debt uh, uh, to, to the sustainable, more long-run sustainable level. And, but the good news is that there is a, there is a uh, way to do it, which is consumption tax increase. And bad news is if you don't do it, there, there will be a fiscal crisis in, in 10 years. And, and Mr. Abe knows this, and the uh, Abe cabinet is working on uh, this stimul uh, the growth policy to make the uh, 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 economic growth rate higher, and which which makes the ground for the tax increase. And if everything goes well, by 2020, the Tokyo Olympic Games, that will be, we will have 20% consumption tax rates and strong growth despite the tax rate hike. Thank you very much. Thank you. It, it's been my privilege to participate in the discussions as a member and as co-chair with Motoshige Ito. And so now let me try to offer a few thoughts on some of what we learned about Japan's implications for the U.S. and our attempts to bring together sort of the two sides of, of the Pacific on these challenges. And I think the place we have to start is the nuanced view of fiscal sustainability that was sort of apparent in, in Takatoshi Ito's presentation and I think has successfully become the norm uh, since the correction of some of the Reinhard Rogoff claims. The, as our colleague Joseph Gagnon has documented and many others have observed, it is difficult to find any point in history where a country that had its own currency is issuing debt in that currency and has an independent central bank has had a crisis of fiscal policy. That doesn't mean it can't happen. And we can think of circumstances where it might. But it does mean that we're not all sitting here teetering on the edge at every moment. Instead, as Japan has demonstrated and the US has been increasingly demonstrating, as numerous members of our group would agree, when you have too high a fiscal deficit to, recurrently, you run into another number of other problems. You tend to displace public investment. 
You tend to bias things towards the present and against future generations. You tend to have less room in case of true emergencies. Japan surviving the Fukushima tsunami and accident certainly knows what a true emergency is, but the U.S. surviving 9-11 is also a true emergency. There are issues of credibility and how people view the world. It is not costless to run ongoing large deficits, even if it is not crisis to run ongoing large deficits. And so part of what I think that we've usefully been talking about is this question of how does one make progress on resolving these issues without phony claim of a crisis. And I think this is a place where the current Japanese government, the technocrats of the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan, and the Japanese people, frankly, deserve a certain measure of credit. That they have reached an intellectual consensus that I think most of us find justified, that Japan, like the US, has a share of GDP going to taxes that is much lower than what we know can be sustained. It doesn't mean that you have to become the Netherlands circa 1984 and put everything into the public system. But it does mean that there is a good 10 to 20 percent of GDP in Japan and the U.S., and notably really only in Japan and the U.S., where the tax rate has stayed much lower and you could raise taxes without causing hugely undue distortions. Now, that is not the only way you can resolve these issues. As we discussed, there are better and worse ways to spend money, and there are certainly pieces of money being spent by both governments that can be cut back. But the, I think the common point and the big lesson from Japan for the U.S. is the idea that a steady, long-term tax increase plan on a national basis can be managed. Now, our colleagues who work on Europe in this institute will also talk about the sort of enforced crisis plans of austerity in Western Europe, and that's a different matter. And I think we should be very conscious of the fact that in Japan, even if we are seeing a path towards a 20 or 22 percent value-added tax rate over, say, 10 years, that's a fiscal drag of less than 2 percent probably 1% a year, and that is not trivial, but nor is it tragic. And it is very much a challenge to the U.S. to think about having a radical restructuring of tax code, let alone an upward, well-established, credibly committed path. Now, let me not get carried away here. Uh, the Abe government and Prime Minister Abe himself have said it's not guaranteed that they're going to raise the taxes again this fall or commit this fall to raising them next, next year, let alone the additional percentages to come. Um, speaking solely for myself, not for the group, I would just issue a warning to people in the Abe government who would like to postpone this that they do so at their peril that there are a large share of Japanese equities and of Jap trade in Japanese yen that are totally subject to market forces, even if the Bank of Japan is buying up JGBs. And you could see a very stiff correction. In fact, I would strongly expect a very stiff correction if we get to late October, early November, and the Abe government does not affirm the next step in the tax increases. Again, is this a crisis? in the sense that those people who've been betting on the collapse of the JGB market will make money? Probably not. Is this really bad in the sense that it would be a huge asset loss in Japan and a setback to momentum and probably build in a permanently higher interest rate? Yes. So now turning to the US, we had a number of experienced ex-Treasury officials, some of whom you'll hear from shortly, and ex-White House officials in our group, and we all are, I must admit, and I shouldn't say we, I'm not one of them, um, members of the group who do that, I think are suitably chastened even more than our battle-hardened friends on the trade front about what is feasible and possible, remembering that we all just came out of the 
uh, tantrums over, over the government shutdown and the debt ceiling and all the rest of it. I think we did, however, thrash out two important things that are worth remembering. The first is there seems to be real improvement on the rate of price increase in health care. And remember that what makes the U.S. debt scary is the rate of inflation in Medicare. It's not our demographics, because we are fortunate to have much nicer demographics than Japan. It is not the level of current spending. It's the rate of inflation outpacing everything else. Um, our Bill Klein has done some interesting work on this and has a paper on the website looking at some of these issues. But the bottom line is there is a strong case to be made that we've seen the rate of inflation of health care decline over the last several years, that it may continue to decline, in fact, it may, we may even see some health care cost reduction. Now, I'm going to leave aside whether that is thanks to, despite, Obamacare ACA. I think there's reason to think that is contributing, but we don't need to get into that. The fact remains we are seeing this in the data. And while we cannot yet count on it as a sustained thing, it helps to emphasize how tractable this problem in reality really is. Instead of people throwing up their hands and saying, oh my God, we're doomed because we've committed too much to Medicare or Medicaid or healthcare or the VA system, uh, it is instead, oh, you mean we have been walking around the world telling the Japanese, let alone the Greeks, let alone the Argentinians, time for you to do structural reform. Maybe we can do some structural reform at home. And in the U.S., there is structural reform to be done. A final point about monetary policy. Um, I and I think the other people on, the, on our panel, our group, who have been active in monetary policy are pretty unstinting in our praise for what the Bank of Japan has been doing for the last year plus. Uh, Professor Ito already mentioned that. I will not recap it. I will simply say that as we extend that to the Fed, I think we are looking at a world where the Federal Reserve is facing a, a limit to how high they can reasonably go on interest rates in the near to medium term. I think even people with very differing views of the short term forecast or the amount of slack in the labor market would agree that given financial regulations and given slowdown in productivity, that probably the Federal Reserve cannot shoot for a neutral rate as high as we used to. This has a number of implications, but the most important one is to say that the room for play we have with the interest rate may be much less than people are accustomed to even when we get off the zero lower bound. And so for that, as well as financial stability reasons, we may need to think about a broader set of tools for the Fed, which, of course, the Bank of Japan has already begun to implement. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I am uh, Masahiro Kawaii. Uh, I am uh, going to talk about uh, the subject of uh, integrating uh, long-term and short-run macroeconomic uh, policies. Uh, I, have a, I have a slide. I, I don't know what uh, I should be doing. Uh, if uh, somebody can tell me, uh, it would be useful. Uh, oh, okay, great, great, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, uh, from uh, a short-term perspective, when uh, there is some shock uh, hitting uh, an economy, we have uh, macroeconomic uh, policy, uh, monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy. Uh, but uh, uh, in the long run, uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, sustained non-inflationary and non-deflationary uh, economic uh, growth is going to take place uh, with financial stability and with fis fis uh, fiscal sustainability. 
Uh, so so uh, that, that's really the issue uh, I want to talk about, uh, Professor Ito and uh, uh, Adam, uh, uh, you know, from their perspectives, uh, talked about uh, this, uh, this issue. Now, uh, monetary policy, uh, of course, uh, Japan, the Bank of Japan, uh, has been uh, uh, using uh, uh, QQE, uh, quantitative uh, and qualitative uh, 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 easing, uh, since uh, uh, April uh, 2013, uh, to achieve uh, uh, sustained 2% inflation rate uh, under uh, Mr. Kuroda. Uh, Takaito talked about uh, fiscal policy to support uh, aggregate uh, aggregate demand. Now, aggregate demand is uh, is now being supported uh, uh, in order to make sure that uh, economic uh, growth would continue, so that uh, uh, the next year the consumption tax rate could be further uh, increased. Uh, in the second quarter of this year. We expect a uh, downturn of uh, GDP because of uh, the consumption tax hike. But uh, in the third quarter, uh, we expect uh, economic uh, growth, positive economic growth, to come back. So the government uh, wants to make sure that uh, uh, aggregate demand would be sustained uh, in order to uh, convince the general public that uh, uh, another consumption tax increase could be, uh, could be implemented. The, uh, from a long-term perspective, if you take a look at uh, this graph, it's, uh, it's really amazing, uh, amazing uh, situation uh, for Japan uh, uh, for 20-some uh, years. Uh, after the bursting of the bubble, nominal GDP uh, blue uh, uh, blue line uh, stayed uh, stagnant uh, for for 20 years. Uh, red uh, graph is uh, real GDP. Yes, we observed real GDP growth uh, in Japan. Uh, when nominal GDP was uh, virtually constant, that was achieved by uh, declining GDP deflator. Uh, this has been a significant uh, problem, and uh, over time in the 1990s uh, and uh, 2000s, uh, Japan persistently ran uh, fiscal deficits, and then debt uh, was uh, was accumulated uh, in 1990. Uh, net government debt uh, was uh, only just about 10 percent, uh, and uh, in 2013 uh, it was 140 percent of GDP, uh, 10 percent of GDP to 140 percent of GDP in terms of uh, net. Uh, uh, government uh, debt as a ratio of GDP. And government revenue was uh, 30% uh, or so in 1990, and uh, 2013, it was uh, also around uh, 30%. But the government expenditure rose from 30% in 1990 to 40% in 2013. So revenue was stagnant, uh, and then expenditure uh, persis persistently rose, and then uh, we have uh, this uh, government debt problem. Uh, from a, a medium-term and long-term perspective, this uh, fis fiscal uh, sustainability issue is the most important, uh, uh, well, at least uh, one of the most important challenges uh, for Japan, uh, financial stability. Financial stability in the case of Japan, uh, I am not that much worried. Uh, it's uh, manageable. Uh, one of uh, the biggest concerns is that uh, uh, if 2% uh, inflation is achieved, then the bond rate can 
can increase, uh, meaning that the bond price would go down and uh, that would have a significant impact on bond holders, including uh, the commercial, uh, commercial banks. Uh, the, uh, according to the BOJ uh, analysis, uh, under the uh, you know, uh, usual circumstance of uh, uh, a reasonable increase of the bond interest rate, the banking sector is basically sound. The overall banking sector is sound. Uh, however, uh, there could be uh, several uh, small regional banks which, uh, which may be affected. Uh, but the uh, systemic uh, problem can be contained. So, so from a medium term and long term perspective, uh, financial stability issue uh, would, be, uh, would be managed. Uh, fiscal, fiscal sustainability is, uh, is quite important. Uh, I agree that uh, more consumption tax increase would be needed, but, uh, but also containing uh, spending uh, would be quite important. Pension spending, health spending uh, have been rising persistently, and somehow uh, uh, we need to contain this, uh, this increase. And also, uh, we need to achieve healthy nominal GDP growth. Nominal GDP growth, 2% uh, uh, inflation plus real GDP growth of 1.5%. Uh, 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 or two percent, uh, and then uh, making sure that uh, the interest rate uh, would not uh, would not jump jump up. I think uh, if uh, we can do that, you know, this combination of uh, containment of uh, spending and uh, uh, consumption tax increase and nominal GDP growth, uh, supported by uh, BOJ monetary policy and growth strategy. Uh, I think uh, in the medium term and long term, fiscal, uh, fiscal problem uh, could, be, could be contained. Ju just one uh, or, or two words on uh, the bond rate. The bond rate uh, remains uh, very low. Uh, the market uh, believes that uh, uh, there is uh, more fiscal room. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and also foreign holding is limited. More foreigners could be, uh, could be induced uh, to hold uh, JGBs. Japan has a huge external assets, uh, which uh, you know, must be giving uh, some comfort to, uh, to bondholders. And uh, the BOJ uh, continues to purchase uh, uh, the JGBs. And, uh, and Mr. Kuroda has been saying that uh, uh, if 2% uh, inflation is threatened, he would do everything possible to make sure that uh, uh, that uh, path, 2% uh, uh, inflation, is uh, to be achieved. I think uh, this would keep the, the interest rate low and the growth rate exceeding the interest rate. Fiscal consolidation is quite possible. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Fisher of the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth and happy to bat clean up here, also a board member of the Institute here. Let me just echo really, and maybe in a different context, some of the things my colleagues have been saying about fiscal sustainability. I have a unique perspective among the group as I was once the debt manager of the United States government and would wring my hands uh, at the thought of managing a debt of $4 trillion outstanding uh, when now we've almost quadrupled that. So the speeches I gave on the subject were perhaps premature. Um, what I'd like to emphasize really about the, the group that we had together talking that have been brought together by our sponsors is the opportunity we have to think about things that we haven't figured out yet, the things we don't know, the things we're trying to learn. And uh, I particularly feel that way, notwithstanding having spent my life in bond markets and debt management, uh, how much we don't know and how much we still have to figure out about debt sustainability both in the long run and the short run. Um, in the long run, I've, I uh, have always taken to heart that uh, a small island nation with a debt to GDP ratio of 
uh, did manage to work its way out of that crisis uh, after the Napoleonic Wars when the United Kingdom managed to uh, bring down its debt to GDP ratio over the next hundred years. An awful lot had to go right for that to happen, and it did go right. And so I completely share the view expressed by Adam and, and others on our, in our group in this panel uh, that things can go right for Japan, but I think there's a lesson that we in the U.S. have to take from the position Japan has gotten itself to. Um, I would emphasize, that back to maybe the, the importance of TPP and other things, the importance of productivity growth for both of us. That's really how we work our way out of a debt problem, a debt sustainability problem. How are we going to get our economy to grow a little faster? We found that in the 1990s in the United States when we even managed to run surpluses for a brief period uh, in Japan, and we now face that problem. How do we get productivity going at a higher rate? And there are many things we have to learn from one another. I think the United States needs to think hard about the lessons Japan has faced over the last decade in demographics. Our demographics are different, but the Federal Reserve certainly is paying attention to our labor participation right here in the United States, and we should think hard and long about the path Japan has been down and what we can learn from that. Um, in the micro, uh, in the near term, as the former debt manager let me tell you, I know when the crisis comes. It comes when you can't roll over your debt when you're nervous that at tomorrow's auction, sufficient buyers will not show up. Um, and while we all can imagine that that's a problem of excess supply, you've got to borrow too much, I've always thought of that as the mere counterfactual. The real problem that will happen to you at tomorrow morning's auction is a failure of demand. That is a failure of bidders who were there a week ago or a month ago not to show up. Something happened to their expectations that changed that's leading them to not want to play and not come to the auction. And I think as Adam emphasized, if you have your own currency, you have your independent monetary policy, interest rates and exchange rates have been adjusting, you're much less likely to come to that rather, that Donnybrook moment, if you will, uh, than if you have other constraints, uh, other constraints. So I think there are things, though, that we can learn from each other in thinking hard about the positions we've gotten into and what it will take to dig our way out of holes that come back to reform, whether on the trade front or the domestic economy front, that we all have to take very, very seriously. Or then the, not the idea that we don't have to worry about a fiscal crisis in our future, I'm afraid, will, will be in the null set. I'll just briefly mention one other issue that I've found fascinating, even though we're in very different positions, Japan and the U.S., uh, on the rate of public investment and public infrastructure. Um, I think there are things we still need to learn from one another about the dilemma of a constrained budget and what happens to that small amount that is left over for investment in public infrastructure and the perverse consequences of less and less productive investments being made. Um, and I, th I think that's, that's a conversation we had that I'm very intrigued with. We see here less and less fiscal multiplier coming from our expenditures. Japan had that experience even as they've managed to bring down the rate of bridges to nowhere. I think we both have to worry about that and that that's a matter of political economy at the micro level. That's another area where I think we could learn from one another. So let me stop there and bring the panel together up, up here on the podium. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we've had uh, four very interesting presentations, and we actually do have some time for questions. There is a roving microphone at the front, and there is a standing microphone in the back, so I would invite you, if, you want the, if you're in the front, to raise your hand, and if not, to line up at the back. <laughs> and since nobody has immediately raised their hand, uh, I, will t <laughs> I will ask the first question. So one of the things that... Um, kind of struck me in these four presentations and the discussion of these macroeconomic adjustments was the lack of the discussion of the exchange rate, which is um, an obsession of some people in this building and uh, more generally an issue of political concern in, in uh, Washington and an issue on which historically the United States and Japan have had conflicts. So I would wonder if anyone on the panel would like to address the role of exchange rate adjustments in achieving um, these um, 
uh, macroeconomic uh, adjustments in the two countries. So um, uh, exchange rates not too undervalued or not too overvalued, roughly in equilibrium exchange rate, is a good thing to have for the uh, macroeconomic uh, event, uh, macroeconomic stability. <clears throat> uh, when the economy is in the weak, the uh, weaker currency will help to boost the um, uh, exports. If it's uh, overheated, probably it's um, um, the overvaluation uh, will help to uh, contain the inflation. That's the general theory. Now, um, Japanese yen appreciated from about 110 to the US dollar to 80 yen uh, in the matter of um, uh, you know half a year uh, uh, after the in the wake of the. Um, Lehman Brothers um, uh, collapse. And uh, that was, um, I would say, uh, mostly because of the failure of the Bank of Japan to uh, expand balance sheet when the Federal Reserve, uh, Bank of England, and ECB expanded their balance sheet, tripled, doubled, and 50% uh, increase. So um, it was you know, partly due to a, a portfolio shift um, um, and uh, partly due to uh, Bank of Japan's faults. But that overvaluation period, 80 yen from 2009 to 2012, was corrected by aggressive monetary easing, thanks to uh, Mr. Abe's um, uh, strong decisions to uh, uh, to correct this um, uh, Bank of Japan's mistake. And now I think the 100 yen, around 100 to 105 box, which the Bank of uh, Japan uh, yen has been in the last 12 months, I think this is a good range that Japanese um, uh, corporations are now gaining uh, 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 strength and the fundamentals are, are getting better. So, you know, that. This is we, we are now back back into the um, uh, comfortable range, and uh, we hope that, that this will continue. Could, could I offer a different perspective, maybe, which is um, exchange rates are an adjustment mechanism. Uh, one of my duties at the Fed was managing currency interventions for the U.S. monetary authorities, and Alan Greenspan liked to remind me that no one has a good model of exchange rate determination, notwithstanding my my monthly reports on what was driving exchange rates one way or the other. I mean, I think that we in the United States especially will do well to recognize the importance of floating exchange rates and learn to live with their consequences uh, and, and, and to see that they play an important role as an adjustment mechanism. And clearly the Japanese yen, given the difficulties the Japanese economy has been in, was much too tight for the last several years, much too strong an exchange rate given the weakness in their economy and the risks of deflation uh, that the second and then third largest economy in the world as it uh, was facing. So I, I think that the most important thing about exchange rates is for us in the United States to have the confidence of our conviction that we believe in them as an adjustment mechanism. Sometimes they'll go up and sometimes they'll go down, and to not uh, paint ourselves or our trading partners into any corners. Quickly, uh, Japanese yen uh, depreciation is uh, clearly a, uh, a result of uh, easy monetary policy or expectation of easy monetary policy before the actual implementation of uh, easy uh, monetary uh, policy. It's a natural, natural result, and the monetary policy uh, has been targeting uh, the domestic objective, domestic objective of uh, rever reversing deflation and supporting uh, the growth environment. Uh, now, uh, yen de depreciated uh, on uh, the real effective exchange rate basis by about 30%. And initially, uh, there was a concern expressed by several Asian countries, uh, China, uh, Korea, and a few others, saying that uh, yen depreciation could be a bigger thy neighbor policy. But, but actually, what's been happening is that uh, uh, Japanese export, uh, real export, uh, has, not, uh, has not quite grown. Uh, 
although nominal ex export, uh, nominal value of export has gone up uh, in terms of yen. And that's uh, what's been helping uh, the corporate sector, the ex exporters. Uh, they have uh, obtained uh, windfall gains. And uh, that, that's been uh, making the Japanese uh, economy uh, uh, brighter. Uh, so uh, the exchange rate uh, usually should have an adjustment mechanism. But so far, uh, Japan, uh, Japan's trade account uh, has not improved. But uh, now Japan runs uh, a trade deficit uh, because of the increased uh, fuel uh, imports and uh, export uh, has not been uh, stimula stimulated yet. Although over time, this uh, effect may come in, but, uh, but not uh, at this point. I guess one last comment. As you're all, I hope, well aware, uh, Fred Bergston and Joe Gagnon from this institute have done a lot of work, not all of which I agree with, but that's fine, um, on the idea that currency manipulation can be a very substantial problem, and there are clearly people in the U.S. Congress who believe that very strongly. And what I think underlies everything Peter, Taka, Hiro, and I are saying, and in particular Hiro's last remark, is that there is a G7 norm that was established a year and a half ago that you don't directly unilaterally talk down or intervene in another member's currency without permission, and that even though some over-eager members of the prospective Abe administration had to be called unwarned on this in December 2012, they then responded. And this is very different than, say, the behavior of SAFE and the People's Bank of China recurrently through the years. And so even as we go forward with TPP, I think we should recognize that Japan and the U.S. and, frankly, the EU are allies in terms of saying countries should pursue their domestic monetary policy goals and not manipulate exchange rates, rather than, as some people would cast it, that there's some division between Japan and U.S. on this point. For, and remember that, with the exception of some intervention in 2011, part of which was justified, uh, Japan has not directly intervened in the exchange market since 2004. Now, were they to change behavior on that, that would be a different matter, but they did not. John Macon. Uh, thanks, uh, John Macon, American Enterprise Institute. Uh, it seems to me you're treading a little lightly uh, on the exchange rate issue. I had thought that uh, in 2012 and early, early 2013, the notion uh, that was uh, advanced uh, partly by the Abe government, but also I think understood by the U.S. government was that it was probably better to have uh, a Japan that's growing in nominal terms uh, at 3% than a Japan that is uh, not growing in nominal terms and still has deflation and yet has a uh, stronger currency. I mean, a weaker currency is an partly an endogenous variable that should be part and parcel of an effort by a country that has experienced deflation to reflate. So I, I, and I, and I think if the outcome is a faster growing total pie, uh, everybody else can perhaps uh, just stand back and let it happen. I'm always amazed at the American government's view where, whereby we overlook uh, over a trillion dollars of dollar purchases by the Chinese, uh, never cite them for uh, currency manipulation, and get very sensitive about very small moves by other central banks. Thank John, you. I mean, I, I think you, you phrased it as though there was a difference between where you were and most of us on the panel, but I don't think there is. And, and to go back, and Minister Doy from the Japanese Embassy read this quote here helpfully about a year ago. Um, then Chairman Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve had a very clear quote and testimony to, I think it was Senate Banking Committee, that uh, you get reflation when you pursue monetary policies to support reflation. 
and that the Bank of Japan was doing something not meaningfully different on the score over the last year than what the Fed was doing. And the People's Bank in China is doing something quite different. And at times, the Bank of Korea has done something quite different. And, and so, in line with what Taka was saying a few minutes ago, you know, it, 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 a big part of the reason why the exchange rate was bad and overvalued for Japan was because unlike other reasonable central banks, the previous regime at the Bank of Japan chose to be deflationary during the crisis, which was insane. Um, but it was credible, <laughs> so the markets reflected that. So we have time for one more question. Anyone wants to ask a question? Yes, Lee. Lee Price from the FDIC. I have a question about, you know, 17 years ago when consumption taxes were raised, some people think that contributed to a, a slowdown of the economy or weakening of the economy that seemed to be emerging. Why should this time be different, that uh, a sizable increase in the consumption tax won't have, it's, it's, I think it's too early to tell what's going to happen in the third quarter and the fourth quarter. Why should we be so confident about in the third and fourth quarter of this year? Obviously, this quarter is going to be to, uh, is going to be negative, but after that, why should it be better than, than 1987? The, 19 the um, uh, experience of 1987 is completely misunderstood by many, and um, uh, the, the misunderstood um, uh, notion is that um, uh, consumption tax hike in April 1987 produced a huge negative growth in 1988. But this is uh, mistaken because uh, negative growth in 1988 is uh, uh, mostly, if not totally, uh, due to the banking crisis which happened in November uh, 1987 and the Asian crisis which happened, started to happen in July. So without those two crises, it would have been okay. So this time there is no Japanese banking crisis as Mr. Kawaii mentioned, uh, uh, stability is, um, uh, the financial system is uh, robust and uh, barring the external crisis, um, uh, I think the um, uh, economy will bounce back. If I could just echo that, that description of history, I think it's, it, when we look back in hindsight in 1999 and 2000, we thought, well, gee, we wish we hadn't had a consumption tax increase in Japan. Uh, but the sequence that year in 1997 uh, was it was actually the rather surprising rate of growth the Japanese economy had uh, that got interest rates to be shocked that led to the collapse of the Thai bot. And so it was actually a movement of expectation of the Japanese economy doing surprisingly well that, that created, there were many other contributing factors, a shock to the East Asian economies. And so I think when we look back in hindsight, we had a consumption tax increase, we had an Asian financial crisis, we had a banking crisis in Japan, and when we got to 99, we looked back and said, gee, it wouldn't it have been nice if we hadn't had a consumption tax increase in Japan? But that's quite something else from saying it was the proximate cause of the uh, rapid slowdown that Japan had at the end of 97 and into 98. Um, I respectfully disagree with my colleagues on that. Um, I do think it was the proximate cause. Nonetheless, I come out where they do on things will be different this time, Lee, for, for much the same reasons. The financial system is much sounder and much better capitalized and much less leverage as our household and corporate balance sheets in Japan now versus 97. So whatever shock you give will not be multiplied to the same extent. And I think my colleagues elided over this. The monetary policy in 1997 was wrong. They were busy tightening, basically, uh, at the first sign of growth, which compounded the impact of the consumption tax hike. And so, but the other point I would make is even I, who usually am held up as the Keynesian dove wanting to always do stimulus, it matters now, as I've been saying for a while, that the debt to GDP ratio is 200 plus percent, whereas 17 years ago in 1997, it was a fraction of that. And so you had a choice in 1997 about spreading it out or offsetting it 
which I frankly don't think you have quite the same amount of choice about it now. So to me, those are the differences. Just say, uh, now, the economic fundamentals are much better than then. Uh, if you take a look at the labor market in Japan, uh, the labor market is uh, very tight. The rate of unemployment has, has uh, come down persistently since uh, the, the peak uh, of immediately after the global financial crisis. Now our uh, unemployment rate is 3.6%, uh, 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 just below uh, the best uh, performance, just pre-crisis. So, you know, uh, and uh, uh, wage pressure, uh, upward pressure is there. And the BOJ, uh, Mr. Kuroda says uh, he would do anything possible if there is a threat to uh, the goal of achieving a 2% inflation rate. Uh, and that, that's providing a lot of uh, confidence on the part of uh, uh, you know, uh, the business, uh, business sector. Okay, well, please join me in thanking our four panelists and we'll move on to the uh, concluding, concluding session of our event. Thank you. I promise you this wasn't set up so I would keep coming back to the podium in some Keystone Cops way. Um, I would like to call upon my colleague and co-chair of our group, Motoshigi Ito of the University of Tokyo. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to be very brief. I think everybody is very busy uh, in many different types of issues uh, in Japan. I'm very busy in talking about many, many issues about Japanese economic policy. So it is very important to get together to discuss the common issue, especially the important issue just uh, you know, the, across the Pacific. So I think the discussion yesterday and today was very, very uh, useful uh, for us uh, to just identify one of the most important area where we have to discuss more carefully. Now, I think I just want to say about TPP because the, that is very important uh, issue for uh, the integration of this region and it is also very in important timing at this point. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the uh, I just lost the memo here. <laughs> uh, the, TPP is a very uh, important project for both Japan and the United States to move forward uh, to new regime of the, uh, the economic integration in these regions. And also it will set a kind of a momentum for uh, the new rules for the global economic system. And just like other uh, trade the negotiations, just negotiation is not very easy. We both have very complicated politics uh, in each other's. But uh, the, in the last, uh, uh, the, uh, the observation just uh, show us this. We are now uh, just focusing to certain very limited area of very difficult uh, issues. So whether we can just go through uh, this, the last dif dif difficult issues such as the uh, POC, automobiles, uh, it's very important whether we can have a very good uh, result of the new regime or just we can just go back to the, uh, the old regime. So I think uh, the, to highlight the uh, importance of the uh, issue and the timing uh, is one of the very important uh, tasks for us to discuss. So I, I hope just uh, the, we can just share some of the very important issue and uh, continue the discussion uh, from now on on this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to close this, uh, let me play my usual role of being a little more blunt than um, some of my distinguished colleagues, Japanese or not. I, I think uh, we've all agreed and cheerleaded for TPP for good reason. Um, 
Morishigi Ito's led that effort within Japan. My colleague Jeff Schott and co-authors have done some great studies here about its importance. Robert Lawrence has articulated, including today, how this sets a precedent going forward. And I think Dennis Blair opening put us in context of how important this is to the overall relationship. And we should not lose sight that TPP is only one part of the US-Japan economic relationship, which includes cross-border investment, joint ventures, uh, training of people in each other's schools, migration and co-production, uh, extensive world of ties in intellectual property and development, and on, and we can hope for extensive ties in natural gas and other energy trade. We should also not lose sight of the fact that economics alone, even TPP within economics, is not the majority of the US-Japan relationship, which is multifaceted and strong. But this is an important moment, as various of us have said repeatedly. And it's a difficult moment because, as Motoshige just reminded us, there's politics on both sides. And so realistically, whether we like it or not, we are unlikely to get a vote on TPP, a strong proposal on TPP in the US Congress until year end or early 2015 after the election, the midterm election. And realistically, unfortunately, that creates a vacuum wherein Japan and some other countries participating in TPP can try to, in a sense, backslide from the aspirations that we could have for the kind of high quality agreement. It is the responsibility of the US government and Japan to the government of Japan, excuse me, to make sure this vacuum does not become self-fulfilling to make sure that we do make progress towards an actual high quality agreement, which will be something that will open up jointly for us the markets that we need in East Asia as well as in Latin America by renewing NAFTA, that will jointly put pressure on China and Korea to play by rules that we can all recognize, including but not limited to exchange rates. These will be open deals, but deals depending on how good Japan and the US shoulder to shoulder can create a high standard agreement that the rest of the countries in the negotiations can agree to. And it is a finite window, not because of threats, possibly because of political patience, impatience, but realistically because Japan is facing a race where many other countries, including the US, are involved in many other regional negotiations. And if Japan and the US miss this window, it will be to the detriment of both of us and the world trading system. But it has to be said, as often as the case in economics, even though both would be worse off without the deal, one would be truly worse off. And so I think it is important that we convey to our friends in Japan, as well as in the US, that as Prime Minister Abe initially said when he bravely took Japan into TPP, reform and growth in Japan is needed so that Japan can play its role in Asia and have some control over its own destiny. And that does mean sacrificing backwards ideas on agriculture that are harmful to the Japanese people themselves. And it will be right if the US and Japanese negotiators get past those ridiculous things in order to achieve the greater goal. Thank you all very much for your participation today. Thanks to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for working with us. Thanks to my colleagues.